Hello all, this is uh, Dr. B with uh, your lecture for uh, Chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 has a fair amount of stuff in it. Um, one of the things I definitely want to talk about um, initially is something called augmentation therapy. And basically, augmentation therapy is pretty simple in the idea. Um, basically, there's some kind of something missing, some product um, that isn't provided and it may be because the gene's broken or other upper you know upstream or downstream regulators um, didn't recognize it or whatnot um, so there's many ways to um, fix this issue depending on what the particular scenario is so I'm just going to kind of start with one that the book has um, which is this and so first of all to understand kind of what this picture is I know it's all crazy looking um, you see here that anything that's metabolite is in black um, and a red arrow indicates whether there's an increase or a decrease in production of that metabolite um, and then you have enzymes uh, the green one for example right here 21 hydroxylase um, this is an, a particular enzyme here um, and you also have disease phenotypes in orange and whatever the treatment options are in purple. So I'm just going to use this one. Um, this is called steroid 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And kind of what's going on here, if you take a look, that this particular step right here, right here with the uh, CYP21A2, this enzyme or uh, this gene basically creates the protein called 21 hydroxylase. And if 21 hydroxylase is produced, You'll see here that progesterone is obviously going to be um, converted to 11 deoxycorticosterone all the way down the line, blah, 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 um, to uh, aldosterone, and then, you know, where it's going to go from there. And obviously, the other thing is you'll see that 21 hydroxylase also converts 17 hydroxyprogesterone into 11 um, deoxycortisol. Boy, that sounded nerdy. But you can see here that if this enzyme, you know, if it's normally present, it's going to downregulate um, all of these things to the next item, the next item um, down the list. If it's not here, if this enzyme isn't present, then the problem is progesterone is not going to be converted to 11 deoxycorticosterone and 17 hydroxyprogesterone is not going to be converted to 11 deoxycortisol. So basically, th these are going to build up. And progesterone building up uh, has its own issues. And as you can see here, um, it eventually leads to an increase in sex hormones. And unfortunately, in this case, it's going to be male sex hormones. Uh, so it's going to be male um, sex characteristics that are going to be uh, basically uh, increased. Uh, and so if you're a female, that's obviously not a good thing. Uh, as this, by the way, is all biological female, not gender female. So um, obviously the treatments would be some sort of uh, genitoplasty, which would be just a f surgery to remove the parts. Um, and preventing would be a particular hormone treatment that might uh, suppress them. So that's kind of one side of it. The other side of it is that because this hydroxylase is not going downstream or causing all of these other um, molecules to become converted, there's a deficiency of mineral corticoid uh, and glucocorticoid hormones. And so a treatment for that is basically a hormone therapy. So this is one particular avenue of um, a gene augmentation where you're not necessarily replacing and adding 21 hydroxylase, but you're treating um, the downstream symptoms of the fact that this enzyme isn't there. Now there are some cases of augmentation you're going to read about where it's just simple enough to just add in uh, 21 hydroxylase. Um, there's also some cases of other uh, particular diseases where you can just avoid uh, the the ingestion of certain foods. So for example, I'm going to talk about PKU for a second. If uh, PKU is in your textbook, but it's a pretty interesting disease. Um, and basically PK is uh, fetal ketonuria. And if you, any of you have a pack of gum on you, it doesn't matter what kind, um, pull it out, stop the video and take a look on it because there's a warning label on all gum. It basically says fetal ketonuric contains phenylalanine. And PKU people um, have a, a um, mutation where they cannot convert phenylalanine to tyrosine 
um, because there's a block of this particular phenylalanine hydroxylase. That's typically where the, the genetic uh, flaw is. So they cannot convert phenylalanine to tyrosine and down the line. So what happens is phenylalanine builds up into phenylpyruvic acid, which as it builds up over months and months and years and years and years can cause severe retardation and potentially death. So in this case, not necessarily an in, in augmentation, but one of the easiest ways to avoid the symptoms of this is to just not eat a lot of food that has phenylalanine in it. Um, so it's a, a basically an avoidance of conversion of this particular system, which is kind of neat. Here's one kind of similar uh, to the first, uh, but an interesting case here. And this is a tyrosine catabolism um, deficiency. And you can see here that this FAH gene is dysfunctional. And therefore, the FAH protein, which normally would decrease uh, fumarate and acetoacetate, is dysfunctional. And so when that's dysfunctional or not produced, you can see that this particular chemical right here, um, fumaryl acetoacetate, would build up. And buildup of that is bad. Uh, it's very bad for neurological stuff. So in this case, the particular treatment, uh, has nothing to do with this particular issue. It has to be up. It has to deal with upstream, um, and the upstream treatment right here is the ability of this particular drug to inhibit this enzyme right here. And so this particular treatment is going to stop an upstream enzyme. And so because of that, it's going to eventually cause a decrease of the production of this chemical here. That's really bad for your liver and other things as well. So um, not to beat the dead horse. But uh, you definitely want to pay attention to this slide. Um, I'm not going to go over all of it now, but this is a lot of the different um, kinds of therapies um, that exist on the augmentation uh, realm. So they're definitely ones you want to check out. So the next part I want to talk about is uh, clinical trials and what they are. Um, obviously, with COVID, there's been a lot of discussion about what a clinical trial is. Um, and they are very important. Um, not all countries perform the same clinical trials or have the same kind of um, uh, tenets, for lack of a better word, of, of what happens in each trial. But generally speaking, um, you have a phase one. It really, I mean, there is preclinical. But generally, by the way, it, it starts here. There's phase one. And the first thing is, is this safe? Uh, that's really the main part of what the phase one is. Is this? It's not necessarily does this thing work uh, as a, a drug to treat what it's supposed to treat, but is it safe? And so generally it's up to 100 volunteers. They are monitored like crazy. Um, can they tolerate it? Can we kind of figure out what the dosage might be? So that's really just um, the fundamentals of, okay, great, this thing's not going to hurt somebody, and we can kind of get an idea how much dosage. Then from that point, you give it to several hundred people to a few thousand in some cases as well. Um, and again, you're looking for safety. And now you're really analyzing, okay, not only safety, but does this thing work? Is there a statistically significant difference between the people that get a placebo and those that get the actual drug? And does the drug do what it's supposed to do? Um, Again, you know, with more people, you're going to have more data and you may have more side effects. So you're going to increase the data count from there. The third part is phase three. And that can be like a few thousand to several thousand uh, people. And that's really where you're going to get more of a diversity of people. You're going to get different races, different um, uh, genders. You're going to get different uh, ethical back, ethnic backgrounds. You're going to get different ages, all kinds of stuff. Uh, to, again, really test this in a very, very large sample. Um, if a drug is found to be effective and safe in phase three, it's then deployed out into the public, which is generally like considered phase four. Um, so you may want to be wondering, like, how did Moderna and Pfizer know? I think Moderna initially with COVID, uh, the first vaccine had like a 94% uh, efficacy. Well, like... How did, how did they come up with that number? So not this is necessarily in your test, but it's really interesting. So let me show you how they did that. So here's kind of one potential version. I'm not saying this is exactly the numbers, but this is generally how this is done. So in the phase three trial, uh, Moderna in all likelihood, get, I believe it was like 30,000 people, um, something like that. Don't quote me on the number though. But they had a lot of people. Half of the people they gave a placebo vaccine to and the other half of the people, you know, we're probably 15 to 20,000 people in each group. Half of those people got a placebo vaccine and half of them got the real vaccine. And basically they just kind of, from that point, let them go, you know, go live your life, go do your thing. 
Um, let's see if, who gets COVID after a period of time. And after the end of this particular uh, trial, the first group here that got the placebo, out of all of the cases of people who got COVID, doesn't mean 94% of those people, but out of the number of people that got COVID, 94% of them came from the group that got the placebo, and 6% of them came from the group that got the real vaccine. So that's what they would do in a phase three trial, and that's really where they can kind of get a better sense of the efficacy of, of how something works. So that's just a cool little side note to help you out. So in general, this is just kind of an image that shows you the different um, types of strategies for gene therapies. Um, and you can see here, you know, just a lot of these are very straightforward. Um, one is basically a cell is missing a gene. Well, you, you give them the gene. Um, that's a nice one. You know, here you have some sort of disease uh, cells and you incorporate some sort of suicide gene, something that ends up killing only the disease cells. Um, obviously, a silencing is another thing that can happen as well. Some sort of protein that shouldn't be made uh, is made. Um, again, indirect cell killing is when there's some activator that will uh, cause um, some sort of, um, to say it better, like this would be a, like a, a, in cancer treatments, which basically bees about, um, the idea of not necessarily just killing the cells straight up, but activating other immune cells um, to become stimulated to then go after the disease cells and kill them. Uh, so it, it's definitely like a, a war. I mean, absolutely. This is another kind of gene therapy, um, ex vivo and in vivo. Um, when I look at this, this reminds me of uh, CAR T cells, um, which is really interesting um, idea. But you can see here in this particular case, um, there's the removal of some sort of cells outside the body, um, and then they are treated in some way and then generally put back into the body. Um, so if, if you're interested in this, you want to read about CAR T cells, that's a neat uh, way that they try to treat some leukemia and some other versions like that. And part of the reason leukemia is it's a very complex disease. But basically your immune cells kind of stop attacking the wrong, the, the cells they should attack. They're, they're just, um, and that's why leukemia has a pattern. So what they can do a lot of times is they can take these white blood cells out of the body, the ones that are doing the job, the ones that are are still trying to fight these uh, the the either tumor or or the uh, incorrectly made cells, and they will grow them up to billions and billions, and sometimes they will um, make them recombinant so that they don't have a, a signal recognition for some of the cell signals that they might get to stop attacking. Um, it's very complicated stuff, but uh, that's the difference of in vivo and ex vivo, um, and uh, I'd say it's proven to be very powerful treatment for a lot of diseases. There's also another way to silence a gene called uh, RNA interference or RNAi. Um, you may have read about it in uh, some other uh, classes or whatnot. Um, but basically, if you take a look at like this, this is not a normal molecule uh, in, in our body. We typically don't think of RNA uh, as being uh, double-stranded. And so, um, the the method of how a cell might be able to like suppress um, uh, protein translation, and so in in much simpler terms, um, it's a normal natural thing that happens where small pieces of RNA can kind of shut down uh, the protein production by binding to messenger RNAs that code uh, for the proteins, and so. Again, it's a natural thing, um, and it's also a potent tool that we use for uh, gene expression as well. And so I won't get into all of the details here, but you can basically see that this long strain of DNA gets cut up by a, a molecule called a dicer. Um, and then from that particular point, there's these uh, SI RNAs, which are small interfering RNAs, duplexes. So basically, it's just they're cut up little pieces of, um, of RNA. And what happens then is these little uh, spheres right here, uh, we call them RISC, but they are uh, RNA-induced silencing complexes. Um, they kind of, as you can see, um, activate the single-strand RNA, part of basically half of this particular duplex. They bind to it, and they basically seek and destroy. And what they do is they take this single-stranded RNA now, and they basically attach them to part of the mRNA. 
Um, and as that happens, you're going to see that there's obviously cleavage of the RNA, um, and that causes the messenger RNA to not be functional anymore. This is a normal thing. Um, I believe this was also uh, discovered in, I want to say violets, the particular plants, but don't quote me on that. I paused the uh, production of my video because I wanted to go check it out. Yes, I was right. It wasn't um, um, necessarily violets, but petunias. You can see here that you've probably seen these colors of petunias before. This is caused by RNAi, which is the white part, which is pretty cool stuff. I found this picture. I kind of want to end this here. I found this picture in the back of Chapter 9 of the questions. Um, and it's a pretty important diagram to kind of understand. It kind of brings everything together. This is just a random metabolic pathway. I believe this is question number two uh, in the back. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, and obviously there's some sort of metabolite A that goes through its whole thing um, and then ends up becoming F. Um, in some cases can become X. Um, and so, you know, just a fundamental understanding of what might happen. So, for example, let me see what, what it asks here. Uh, yeah, so if uh, the gene that produces enzyme 4 were to be um, inactivated, so this enzyme which converts D to E is inactivated, like what would happen? And obviously you should understand a couple things. One, D is going to pile up uh, in a level that's way high. E will not be produced. F will not be produced. Um, and so that's just kind of a fundamental understanding of, of kind of what I wanted you to get from that. So again, this video for nine is fundamental. It should be the very first thing you look at to kind of get a, a general idea about um, what gene augmentation is and, and, and kind of how we can uh, do this uh, in, in several ways, how we can use the technologies um, to help people. So on that note, uh, good luck, and I will talk to you all later.